Thank you. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for attending the second talk of the series this semester the, um, by the Special Libraries Association student group at the iSchool, San Jose State. My name is Grace, and I'm a student here and the program coordinator. And I'm here to help Basia, who started this Adventures of a Special Librarian series. And she has a great lineup of speakers coming up. And today, including today, speaker, Erin Smith, and um, we will have speakers in the future from Nike, a law librarian, a blogger, and SLA tw Twitter, and then our own Dr. Michelle Chen at DI School. So we hope to see you at those talks as well. And then Bossy, our president, she will introduce our new speaker today, Erin. Hi, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Basha Belaska Elliott. And I would um, like to introduce our speaker, speaker Aaron Schmidt. Thank you for coming, Aaron. Um, Aaron is a principal of the Influx Library User Experience Consulting Firm, which um, is a great firm designing um, library experience websites and so on. I'll give you a um, URL in just a second. He is also a website usability blogger and has a very highly regarded um, UX blog um, entitled Walking Paper, and is a regular contributor to the Library Journal. And he also teaches uh, an excellent course on library usability, on library user experience at the iSchool. I took that course before, and I highly recommend it. And um, finally, the one last thing I wanted to mention is that Aaron has a brand new book out called Useful, Usable, Desirable, just like the title of our talk today. And I have taken a look at it, and I really like it, and I'm planning to buy it for my library. And I highly encourage you to check it out at the library or to purchase it yourself. That's a little plug that's not really, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's very informal. But I just wanted you to know that that's a, um, it's an excellent resource for libraries, and it's a sort of a book that takes you step by step through everything and um, you know, really la allows you to evaluate what you're doing. So fantastic hands-on um, sort of a handbook. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. And um, I hope you enjoyed the talk today. Thank you, Aaron. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to be here. And uh, I just want to say off the top that uh, all the technical uh, stuff at the beginning, probably totally my fault. I sent Grace and Basha a PDF, like, 45 minutes ago or an hour ago, you know, uh, if I had gotten to that to them yesterday, it probably would have all been ironed out. But here we are. I'm sharing my application. You should be able to see my title slide here. Um, so we've got all that ironed out. Again, thanks a lot for being here. Um, I am willing to take this conversation in whatever direction it goes. So um, pipe up in the chat box if you have any questions or comments. I'll be looking at that. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm so good at looking at the chat box. In a, a synchronous session uh, last week for my library UX class for the iSchool, um, I, uh, I was looking at the chat box, and I didn't see that I had not properly hit the talk button. And I was talking for like 10 minutes before someone chimed in and was like, what's going on here? So that was pretty embarrassing. Um, at any rate, we'll just uh, move on from there. I assume you can all hear me now. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, so uh, thanks for you all taking the time to be here as well. Um, let's see. Today, I'm going to try. I'll talk a little bit about my thoughts about library user experience. It's sort of a very condensed version. My presentation will be a very condensed version of um, sort of the introductory lecture for the class. Uh, that I teach. I'm teaching it now. I don't think I'll be teaching this class um, in this summer. Uh, I'm going to be teaching the, the 200 class coming up as well. Um, so I'm really excited to branch out to a different class for the school and um, kind of infuse it with some library UX stuff as well. So that should be great. And uh, yeah, so again, any questions or comments, uh, let me know. Um, and let me just run through this real quick so we can uh, get to some conversation. Oh, and let me let me have another disclaimer here. My background is in public libraries. I love public libraries. I um, don't no longer work in a public library. I still work with a lot of public libraries, 
That being said, this is, you know, the SLA um, student chapter. I don't think there's too much of a conflict here, though, because user experience as a framework is great for thinking about all sorts of problems uh, in libraries, no matter what what type. So even though a lot of my a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today um, might have a public library bent, as a framework, I think it can be applicable no matter what form of librarianship uh, ignites your passion. So speaking of a public library example, here we have um, 13 steps. This is a common library task broken down into a bunch of different components. And I want to start off with this just to highlight the fact that the stuff we do in libraries is um, there's a lot going on in just a simple library task. This, this task is um, someone finding out about an item, uh, placing a hold on it, and picking it up at the library and checking it out. There are a lot of different moving parts in this picture, right? We have something in print. We have some stuff online. We have some physical building things. We have a customer service interaction in step 12 here. All of these things um, need to be working in unison in order to create a good user experience. And this is actually a little bit of a user experience technique here uh, called a journey map. And it helps oftentimes when trying to think about a problem in the library or trying to optimize the service to break things down into steps and think about from a user's perspective uh, what is going on and examine what, what might be hindering uh, them in their progress, what is helping them complete their task, what they might be thinking and feeling during each step in this task, and assess it as a whole and see where things can be improved and um, also what the library is doing well. Let's not forget about that. So just a simple thing like um, finding out about an item, placing a hold and picking it up has a lot of moving parts. And um, yeah, so while I think some of the concepts behind library user experience are, are com a bit commonsensical and straightforward, it can get quite complicated trying to optimize this stuff. And I think we all know, uh, having experienced libraries a lot, that there is a lot to optimize in libraries, right? Here we have one form of library interaction design. Luckily, we've moved beyond this in libraries, and we're a bit more free with a lot of our stuff now. Um, not always, but, but most of the time, right? Here's another form of interaction design, card catalogs. I, uh, I worked in libraries when there were still card catalogs. They're still around, you know, some places if you look. They're not our primary way of interacting with bibliographic records anymore, uh, thank heavens. Although, of course, there's a certain romance to them, isn't there? Another form of interaction design that is a little bit problematic in libraries quite often is our signage. This is one of my favorite signs for a number of reasons. Yes, yikes indeed. Um, we have a... Uh, we have um, kind of a, an ugly sign, don't we? It's also ugly in its attitude. It's quite mean, and it's patronizing. Look in the bottom right-hand corner. It says, thank you. Um, not a very nice message to be sending. Just some other examples of signage. This is like lowest um, um, common denominator, really low effort, and low returns for a sign like this. Here we have a library sign that, again, is a little bit unreadable. It's also stating something totally commonplace, that when you talk, People can hear you, right? Uh, no big deal. Yes, San Comic Sans. We have uh, someone recognize it, Kristen. It's true. Uh, here's another great one. Um, I'm, I'm working with a number of libraries right now in Florida, and um, I can tell you about that project uh, if you're interested. It's a pretty cool one. Uh, this library that I'm working with, our main task is to declutter the library so the building can shine. It's a really great 75-year-old historic, beautiful Art Deco-ish building that has just been filled with um, stuff. And uh, we're going to try to remove as much as possible to let the building shine. And anyway, from one spot in the library, you can see four of these signs. Um, it's pretty much common sense that when there's a fire alarm, you should leave the building, right? Um, so this sign, these signs are going to go. Uh, and let me just state, you know, I'm being a little bit critical here, uh, but I'm not being mean. This is not coming from a place of snark or um, kind of holier than thou or whatever. Central to doing UX is doing criticism, and you have to do it with a gracious attitude. You have to do it with a helpful attitude, or else, especially in your library, you're really not going to get anywhere trying to make changes, right, because people are going to be turned off to the situation. So I do have some examples of good stuff uh, coming up later in the presentation, 
um, but I want to start with kind of setting up the problem here with library user experience. Okay, the language we use is um, really an important form of interaction design and one that certainly impacts how people uh, perceive us and how easy or difficult we are to use. So cooking um, is a much more human, much more user-centered word than cookery, right? Two types of people use the word cookery, cooking nerds and library nerds. Uh, actually, the Congress, uh, Library of Congress subject heading has changed to cooking now, so that's a uh, nice user experience and usability victory. Uh, thank heavens. Okay, another form of interaction design that is uh, oftentimes problematic. And this is, I think, um, very important for special libraries, considering that oftentimes there is no physical presence in the special library. Our electronic resources. So here we have a website. This is a screenshot from 2011. Looks like it's from like 1999. Pretty bad stuff. Um, yeah. And here's a great combo of uh, the language in libraries and websites. So this library, instead of using user-centered and human-centered language in their website and in their library, they've decided to create a glossary expecting people to become miniature librarians and to get like a little education about libraries um, instead of uh, just making things easy to use. I get the implication or I get the intention here. It's really admirable that they say, okay, we want to make our stuff easier to use. Let's explain this stuff to them. So I, the intention is really great here, um, but the execution I think is um, is lacking. So. Not only our websites, but also other electronic resources. Again, def definitely um, important for special libraries where the electronic resources and databases are such a big part of uh, a service. We have no control over these interfaces, and that is a huge problem. Um, you can think of the library website as this central hub with a bunch of different spokes going out to different resources. and. None of these things uh, we have very much control over, and this is difficult. It would be great to be able to provide a seamless, easy-to-use experience in all these resources, um, but alas, we cannot. So um, big red flag there, for sure. So that's just a very small bit about interaction design in libraries, um, trying to paint a holistic picture here of ways that people interact with us, face-to-face, uh, -face, our print stuff, our signage, our buildings, our electronic things, all these things come together to create a user experience. And um, the goal is to optimize all this to make it useful, usable, and desirable. That's sort of a holy trinity, I think, that we can think about to improve our stuff. Uh, these things are not mutually inclusive. Something can be very easy to use, but uh, not useful. Um, something can be very useful. For instance, like this, this uh, catalog right here. Pretty useful thing, but not necessarily easy to use. Um, so this optimization is a fun and important part of creating a good user experience, but user experience design goes deeper as well, and it deals with this sort of existential question in librarianship of what are we doing here, what's our purpose, uh, what's the goal of the library. So user experience has some things to say about that as well. And um, just to sort of set up the problem, as I have done uh, hopefully a little bit uh, about interaction design, let me do the same with sort of this big purpose, this big picture question in libraries as I see it. Libraries in the past have been places of access to information, uh, whether this is books uh, or databases. We have helped solve the problem of information scarcity. We have pooled resources, we've collected them, we've centralized them and let people access them. This is a really great, important thing, and it still will continue to be, I think. There's one problem with it, though. Uh, this problem that we have sort of historically helped solve is less of a problem. Um, the problems around information are changing. Information is no longer scarce in the way it was, right? There is so much information now it has exploded. Um, so, I think um, we are sort of in this mindset where we're trying to solve a problem that is no longer needs to be solved in the same way. Um, and this is, uh, this is an opportunity. So in public libraries, we have certainly done more than just um, been places to access information. We also have done sort of social programming. Story time is a classic example. And I don't really know what the analog is in special libraries. I've never worked in a special library. I, I don't necessarily think 
that the special library as a gathering place um, is a, a model that is around much. And if that is, uh, if I'm wrong about that, please um, let me know in the chat. Um, so I'm interested to hear your perspectives on this too, about other sorts of things that, um, other sorts of problems that, that special libraries are solving. Um, so, you know, public libraries have done more than just provided access to raw materials, but it's really what public libraries are known for, and it's certainly, I imagine, what special libraries are known for as well. Um, books, electronic resources, this is our brand, according to OCLC. Every time they interview people and they survey people, they say libraries are all about books. And this, to me, is a little bit of uh, shaky ground because reading is changing, and I'm not trying to give you, like, a, um, uh, really, like, a um, scare, you know, scare tactic, like Fox News style, oh, e-books, whatever. Um, but at least we can acknowledge the fact that reading is changing and the publishing world is changing, and this is impacting the libraries, right? So an example of the problems of interaction design and this large-scale problems of purpose coming together is perfectly demonstrated in this comic book, uh, this comic called Why Digital Rights Management Doesn't Work or How to Download an Audiobook from the Cleveland Public Library. This uh, tech-oriented guy had a hard time and decided to document all the crazy steps it took to use a library resource. And this led to step 19, give up on stupid library. Not a good experience, right? Not what we're supposed to be, um, not, what we're, not how we want to be treating our people, right? The interesting thing about um, poor online resources and poor electronic resources is that, to me, that there's such a disparity um, and such a disconnect between how we interact with people face-to-face -face and how we interact with them online. I have met very few librarians who give crummy customer service face-to-face. -face. We're a helping profession. Um, I think uh, a lot of us are motivated by wanting to improve people's lives and, and connect people to stuff that's going to help them. And, um, and that comes out in, that's demonstrated by really great customer service in libraries, and I think that's um, I think it's a fantastic thing. And having resources that sort of behave like this or crummy websites, uh, to me, is like um, uh, uh, you know not a very good interaction. And it's like having the worst reference librarian out out um, serving your your people. Um, so there's a little bit of a disconnect, and I just wish we could. Um, take this electronic service as seriously as we take face-to-face -face service. I know there are all sorts of um, associated challenges, um, and again, we don't have control over a lot of this, but it's still an important thing. At any rate, um, yeah, I totally agree, Erica. Um, it's a it's a bind we're in, and and it's even tough. We can't even really vote with our dollars because there's not really a great alternative in a lot of cases, right? We could say collectively, okay, we're not going to buy your stuff unless you make this a better experience for our users, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, that would completely disrupt service and probably wouldn't fly in many cases. Okay, let's enter into a fantasy world for a minute here. And let's say that we could create something like this. Great interface, great content, um, and, um, you know, in this case, streaming movies. Et cetera. But let's let's say we can make this, or let's say we can make all of our resources in a single search box, super easy to use, super clear, um, you know, not mucked up like this at all. Um, could we do that? Uh, I, I don't. I think well, maybe we could if we really devoted a lot of effort to it. But I don't think this is the end goal to copy this service or to copy this service. Um, this puts us a step behind. It puts us at a strategic disadvantage. Um, because we're just sort of playing catch up to what other folks are doing. It also reinforces what Joan Fry Williams has called the grocery store model of librarianship, where someone enters into a library, I guess either physically or digitally, whether public or academic or special or whatever, and enters the library, gets a bit of content, then leaves and goes and does something with that content elsewhere. This to me is a shallow form of librarianship, and it doesn't really enca encapsulate, it doesn't really capture this transformational aspect of, of libraries. So I think we can do better. Also, there are some canaries in the coal mine, aren't, aren't there? These places 
Granted, they're different than libraries in that there's a commercial focus, um, but re regardless, um, these places are similar in nature in that they are content repositories. They're physical buildings where physical media was kept. People entered these buildings and left and went home and used them. These two places are right, exactly, Kristen, not anymore. Um, they're just gone. So, um, again, I do think it's a little bit different. I think there's all sorts of goodwill around libraries, especially public libraries. Um, communities will vote for libraries. Communities say that libraries are important to them, even if not, even, even if people don't use them. Um, so I think there's some special goodwill. Regardless, I think this is worth paying attention to, right? These places are having trouble. Um, will we as well? And I think um, the answer is potentially yes, especially because relying on circulation statistics or numbers of hits in your databases is a little bit of an unsustainable way to measure what we do. There's only one good kind of search stat. That's one that's higher than the month before. This is how we show our worth, how we demonstrate our worth to stakeholders. And I think it's a very shallow way to do it, and I, I wish we had a better way to, to demonstrate what we do. Um, so stories like this totally freak me out. Here we have a 24-hour automated library, and you, know, you can't see me here, um, but I'm going like this in the air. I'll put it in the chat box. Oops, I'm going like this, doing some air quotes. Um, to me, this is not really a library. This is a book kiosk, and um, this is not a, the fullness of a library. Um, what's the problem here? There are no people. There are no librarians. And it's, I guess it's easy for a you know, major news outlet to kind of conflate a book kiosk to a library, but I still think it's, um, it's kind of unfortunate. Now, this is a great service. I'm all about um, great services, and uh, this is very convenient for people. And um, I don't think there's a reason to, there's not a reason to not do this. This is a great service, but uh, what else can we do? Uh, what else can libraries do uh, to go beyond this? So um, not just in the United States, here's another interesting story. All sorts of funding um, issues in the UK around libraries, and in particular public, public libraries. Here we have uh, an article from The Guardian where books from libraries are moving into pubs and cafes. Now, interesting idea, right? Um, I think books and pubs and books and cafes is a fine idea. Could be a very convenient service. I like a beer, I like a coffee, I like books. but. Uh, I wish that this was happening from more of a place of strength rather than like retreating into the last vestiges of sort of public spaces in the UK. Um, so uh, that's interesting to me. Also, I read somewhere recently that the library, public library in Birmingham, which is a major multi-year building um, project there, really um, interesting building. Uh, it opened, I think, mean, last year or the year before, and now they're facing troubles, uh, lack of support and lack of funds. Um, so that is a sort of shame. Um, yes, Kiri, I totally agree that um, if uh, if we expanded our brand, which is a which is a difficult thing to do, that there wouldn't necessarily be this um, this confusion, I guess. And you know, OCLC says that books being our brand is a big advantage and, and we should just play play on that and play that up. I think that's a little bit short-sighted. I happen to think that they might have a vested interest in keeping libraries in the kind of the book business, um, given what they do. Um, and it is extremely hard to shift a brand and fully acknowledge that, um, but I think it's something we might want to shift towards. So that's um, setting up I guess it's like my highly sort of critical view of what's going on in libraries at the moment. I see some interaction design problems. Um, I mean, to be fair, I think there are interaction design problems throughout the world, right? It's not just libraries, but um, those are some of the issues in libraries. And that's uh, some of the issues going on, um, kind of bigger picture existential issues for libraries. And I think through um, doing user experience design and thinking about the needs of our community, we can get beyond this stuff and we can design services that are meaningful to our communities, whether that's a corporation or a university or, or a town. And, um, and we can also make that stuff more pleasant and easy to use. Um, so questions, comments. 
up to this point. Okay, um, I think I would just like to go positive for a minute here and um, show you some cool cool um, bits of library user experience and um, go from there. So I was hard on some libraries and demonstrated some poor signage. Let me click around and show you some signs that I like. This is a great alternative to that ugly sign I showed earlier. This is friendly, this is easy to read, uh, it emphasizes the positive rather than the negative. So good job, Carnegie Library, Pittsburgh. And um, uh, they have a great sign. Here's another great sign that they have. Again, this small thing in the parentheses, this parenthetical, it's easy. It doesn't have to be there, does it? But they've taken this opportunity to sort of humanize this one small interaction. And, you know, this sign alone um, with this small element isn't going to change um, the whole library, but you know if they're paying attention to details like this and this sign, and they pay attention to details in similar signs, and they pay attention to similar details on our website and their face-to-face -face interaction interactions, all of this adds up to um, create a great experience. So every little bit counts. Um, I really do believe this. Um, okay, a fantastic example here. This is the bad example. I'll just let me just start off with this. This sign again. Uh, this this is not really um, adhering to many um, best practices for graphic design. We'll say that's a I guess a nice way to say that it could look nicer, right? Um, it also is a bit um, like shaking your finger <laughs> at someone, right? So this is pretty interesting. I was um, working with the library in Iowa City, Iowa City Public Library, really cool central library. I don't know if you've been there. Um, located on this pedestrian mall in College Town, neat place. Um, so before I actually just came across online the sign that they had in their library, and I was going to, in a, in a positive, kind way, take them to task on it during the presentation, right? Um, but as I'm walking up to the library, and as I'm walking them to get inside on the cold Iowa morning, I saw this window in their children's area peeking inside a little story time room, and what did I see? I saw that they had redesigned the sign uh, before I could take them to task. And I thought it was such a fantastic example. Same um, emphasis here, same thing trying to be accomplished, but in a uh, much more easy to read, much more pleasant, much more beautiful, and importantly, positive sign with some library branding. I mean, they really um, knocked it out of the park with the sign, I think. Um, it is easy to read and playful, which is appropriate for children's department. I agree, very appealing. I mean, just compare this, which is ugly and is yelling at um, your library patrons, to this. I mean, it's just so fantastic. So I was so happy when I came across this. I got to high five and uh, high five the woman who made this, and um, it, was a, it was really great. Um, definitely more carrot. That is a great way to put it. Um, sticks, not effective. Carrots are tasty. Okay, so some other great signs. Um, here's a really fantastic series from uh, Alberta Libraries up in Canada. Kind of a just fun, edgy, we'll say, um, uh, signage campaign. Um, really, really wonderful. Um, if you haven't seen uh, the branding platform of the Edmonton Public Library. I highly encourage you to check that out as well. Um, they do a really great job with um, with their stuff. Their stuff is all throughout Edmonton on billboards and on, on their building, and it's eye-catching, and it's friendly, and it's great. And um, we're helping them with uh, website redesign to better um, kind of demonstrate their great branding. Uh, so that is uh, going to be a cool project. Okay, more great cool graphic stuff. And this is just sort of a small, small selection here. Uh, I love this, love this logo from the National Library and Cutter. I mean, I think it's beautiful. I think it's eye-catching. Just a small, small piece of great graphic design coming out of the library. Okay, so aside from this um, fine stuff, which, you know, I was, I was hard on some libraries before and just want to share some good examples. I want to expand, expand the scope out 
and talk about these bigger picture existential questions in libraries. So if we must be places of collections in libraries, I think um, reconceiving that uh, and reconsidering what sort of what we are, what it is we are collecting is an interesting way forward. So this is a public library situation where they have a lot of people that bake in their community. So they're collecting cake pans uh, to circulate these. Am I saying that circulating bakeware in your special library or, or in your university is the right answer? No, I'm probably not, right? Unless your special library wants to become more of a friendly community oriented place and you happen to have a lot of people baking um, on staff, then maybe it would be appropriate. So um, these things are not right for all libraries, but I think it's an interesting way that they have reinterpreted their role as collectors of stuff to provide um, for their community something of interest to meet their needs. So, fantastic. Chicago Public Library and New York Public Library got some grants from the Knight Foundation, I believe it was, to circulate internet hotspots and laptops. It was a big success and these programs are being expanded. So they are helping solve the digital divide by having this collection available to folks. Pretty neat stuff. This is a this is a cool one. This is um oh great, custom H. Uh where is it that you're circulating these things? And I'm, I'm happy that the program has been successful. Um this is a cool one. Oh no way, you're from Stickney? That's crazy. I grew up in Western Springs, small world. Um Okay, um, here we go, library farm. You can check out a plot of land at this public library in upstate New York. You can grow vegetables with like-minded individuals in the community and learn together by doing at this library. So instead of just being a place of content consumption, right, where someone goes in and gets something and goes home and gardens alone, uh, they're gardening together, and um, I think it's uh, really cool. I think our library spaces are a huge strategic advantage in, in what we do, and you don't need to have a uh, fancy green modern tree in your library to um, take advantage of it, but I guess it wouldn't hurt. I like to think of library spaces like the old style, or I guess not necessarily old style, uh, but a gymnasium floor. Have you guys seen um, gym floors like this? Are they still around? Am I dating myself for some reason? Well. When I was in elementary school, this is what the gym floor looked like, right? They are painted in different ways for different uses, um, different types of use in different sports. So here we have tennis, volleyball, wrestling, basketball, um, what else? Maybe badminton, soccer. So there, the, the space can be reconfigured and reinterpreted in many different ways depending on the need at the moment. So there are a couple of examples of this happening in action, and um, this, this one is theoretical, but I think it's pretty cool. This is a, a library of library fixtures and pieces of furniture, and this is um, a design in response to a competition that um, went on in, I think, the Brooklyn system? I can't exactly remember, but um, this, was, this, was a, this um, design firm came up with all these different things that can be mixed and matched to create sort of semi-permanent library spaces uh, that can change uh, frequently depending on what is going on. So I think that's pretty pretty neat. And in action, in the real world, here we have the idea box from Oak Park Public Library. And they have a space that they reconfigure every few months, or uh, maybe every few weeks, and it is an experimental space that they use to learn about uh, what services they should be providing. So Kristen and Stickney, you can go over to Oak Park and uh, check out their idea box and see what's going on now. Here we have a park-like setting, park -like setting that they made in the middle of Chicago winter, which is, uh, if you've uh, ever experienced one of those, you know what a delight it might be to have a sunny, bright park uh, to hang out in and read for a while. Uh, here's another incarnation of it, and I think they have um, updates on their website about what they're doing with their idea box, so you can always check that out online as well. 
I just love this example, um, so I'm going to mention it again as a kind of library space type thing. Here we have the forthcoming library in Helsinki. Their current library, they call it Library 10, is a pretty great space. There is a definite emphasis on creation rather than just consumption. Um, it is the central library in Helsinki, and it is mostly a music library because this is what people in, in Helsinki have uh, decided they wanted as part of their uh, library. So books are available, but there's mostly a lot of music. And there are instruments. There is a recording studio. There's a radio station. There's a lot about um, creation in, in addition to consumption. And the space is actually highly reconfigurable as well. Um, a pretty cool thing. We've got DJ nights going on, all sorts of cool things. Anyway, their new building coming, uh, being open, uh, will be open in a few years. It is going to have a sauna in it. And I think this is just a really great thing. Saunas are really foundational to Finnish culture. And they are, the library is taking this seriously by um, including one in the library. Now, totally culturally uh, appropriate for Finland, probably not for the United States. Um, so I think it's just a really interesting comparison and a cool thing. So um, yeah, so uh, good conversation going about um, the, the drawing line between or this tension or complementary nature between libraries being a community center or not. Um, so this is up for debate, to be sure. Um, and I think uh, libraries should be a community centers. It all depends on how you interpret the mission of a, of a library, right, and what libraries are supposed to do. Um, libraries, I guess, um, are meant to, I mean, how narrow do you want to be or how, bro how bro broad do you want to be? If you define libraries narrowly, right, they're a place, place for books to, to be and for people to go check out books. Um, or to expanding that out a little bit, libraries are places for learning, right? Uh, and once you expand it out like that, then pretty much the sky's the limit, I think, for how you want to interpret learning and how you want to um, make that happen by connecting people to information, by connecting people to people, and um, providing things that are um, worthwhile to improve their lives, to entertain them. Um, so, you know, on one hand, I sort of want libraries to do fewer things because I think when libraries do fewer things, they can be more excellent at any one thing that they do because they can devote more time and effort to it. But on the, on the other hand, I also, I also do not think it's necessarily mission creep for libraries to do things like some of my favorite library programs, like the public health nurse in Pima, Arizona, or the social work nurse in San Francisco in various places, uh, or the library in, in Baltimore, you know, Pratt Free, that is partnering with an organization to um, let people pick up groceries, healthful groceries in a grocery store, or even the Salt Lake City Library, who's now um, thinking about being open 24 hours a day to become a full-on homeless shelter on the ground floor. Um, this is this is fascinating stuff. Um, some people might say, hey, well, it's not the role of the library to be a social worker, but, you know, to me, it's the role, the role of the library is to improve people's lives and to connect people to information when they need it. And I think a uh, library social worker, public health nurse in the library, um, or the, say, co-located Vancouver Public Library slash YWCA that's opening this year that is going to house low-income single mothers, um, it's really fantastic stuff. So, to me, um, user experience is so interesting because we can be a bit more shallow and polish libraries up on the surface with in pieces of interaction design like signage and our interfaces, but thinking about the needs of our users and going deep with that and looking at our communities and examining what they want and how we can improve them uh, leads to some really more deep, interesting results. And, you know, I don't have a slide for this, um, but maybe uh, Basha can e email this link out to everyone. I think it's such an important article in, in library literature. I think it's really great. It's called What's a Library Worth? It's by Eleanor Joe Rogers. And actually, hold on, if I, um, since we've got chat here going on, let me just uh, open up my Dropbox. 
if you don't mind. And here we go. Okay, boom. There's the PDF for you. Eleanor Rogers, What's a Library Worth? It's a fantastic article about library advocacy and library user experience, uh, no matter what type of library you're interested in. And um, in, in it, she, she basically mentions no library exists in a vacuum. Every library is in a host ecosystem. And instead of doing what's good for the library, libraries need to turn outward and do what's good for the host ecosystem. And she notes that this has two benefits. Well, since libraries are part of the host ecosystem, when the ecosystem's healthy, libraries are going to be healthy as well. That's really important. But also, when libraries are seen by stakeholders and by the ecosystem as being a positive player and a positive force in that ecosystem, well, then they're going to be supported so they can do more good, right? So um, to me, it's just a really fantastic article. It's one of my favorites in all of the library literature. So I hope you will take a few minutes to, to read that. Um, yeah, so I um, think there's a lot of interesting conversation to be had about this um, role of the library as a community center type place. Um, one sort of obvious intersection between libraries and the community is the collection development policy, right? Um, every library wants to have a collection that is relevant to their users. Um, because we are places that are meant to serve our communities, right? So even even um, something foundational in, in libraries as a collection development policy um, has to, you know is related to the li the library's community and in a sense opens up the door or at least acknowledges that we can should be community centers, I guess. Um, okay, a few more slides and then. Um, we can ask more questions. So I think really important to this is promoting new standards of success. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do this. It's something that I want to devote some more time to thinking about. Um, but I wish we could tell our stories to our stakeholders in a different way. Um, so let's all think about that. So who should be doing this stuff? You know, I didn't get at all in, in this presentation about, uh, I didn't get into any user experience techniques. but. Uh, luckily, you know, to learn about our users and design libraries for them, there is a whole host of, of um, proven techniques that we can use to learn about them, whether it's journey mapping, contextual inquiry, um, user interviews, um, surveys, which I'm not so hot on, but there are a lot of different techniques that we can use to, um, to do this work. And if you take my class, I'll teach you all about it. <laughs> No, just joking. Um, there are a lot of resources that you can use um, to learn about this stuff, plenty of stuff to read online, and uh, plenty of great books to read as well. Um, but yes, we do go over all these techniques in the class, and uh, you get a little bit of experience doing user research and user experience design, both for stuff on the web and sort of real-world stuff, uh, all the way from graphic design to usability testing to um, uh, rewriting stuff for the web, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so I'm a big fan for this to be everybody's job in the library. We, uh, in libraries, everyone needs to take this seriously because everything we do in libraries impacts this overall user experience. So this is definitely um, one of my favorite little phrases here. I think that um, if we just are mindful of making improvements, this is a great way uh, forward because not to um, not to make everyone like second guess themselves and take every decision like too seriously. Not trying to give us analysis paralysis or anything like that. But um, let's just make sure we're making improvements, right? So this UX stuff is um, not new in libraries. One of my favorite writers um, in library literature is this librarian, Gracia Countryman. She was a librarian from Hennepin County in the early 20th century. And I think she might have been president of ALA too back uh, then. And this is such a great sentiment. Um, I love what she is writing here about taking, taking down unnecessary restrictions, putting people face to face. Um, it's just really great. She also has some great quotes about trying different programs in libraries like game rooms, and smoking rooms, which is pretty funny, 
Um, so even this, like, gaming, gaming and library stuff is not new. Uh, it's been around forever. Lisa, the name of the article is called What's a Library Worth? And yes, Eleanor Joe Roger. Uh, I hope her name is on that PDF that I just sent. I'll just uh, put the link there again. Uh, it appears in, I believe, the September 2007 issue of American Libraries. Um, so, yes. Okay, I um, want to make sure there's some time for questions, but I just want to um, show you one more resource. If you are interested in library UX stuff, I recommend you check out Weave. It is the Journal of Library User Experience. Uh, I'm uh, honored to be on the editorial board of this great publication. We are on our second issue. It is a new open access journal. Some pretty great articles in both the current issue and the new one. Um, and if you end up doing some great work in library user experience, please uh, s submit an article as well. Um, but really excited about Weave. Um, check that out if you are interested in learning more. Also, I'm going to scroll up here. Basha mentioned um, this book that my partner Amanda and I wrote. It is a very practical guide to learning about and assessing and improving user experience in libraries. It consists of um, a, a list list of checkpoints that you can use to assess what's going on around the topic and then um, it tells you, uh, make some suggestions at least about how you might improve it. Um, so we're really proud of this book. It came out um, getting to be about a year ago. The reception's been, been really great. Um, oh, Kristen's right, great. Um, so um, those are two resources for uh, some further reading if you are at all interested and if you're really turned on. Uh, buy it. You can um, sign up for the class with this list. i um, be happy to have you. Um, I know Basha has taken it. Brian here has um, been involved taking the class. I don't know. I don't recognize any other names, but I could be missing somebody. I see Christy C, but I don't know if she's in, currently in the class. Um, oh, Stephanie. Well, you can always come back and maybe audit the class when you don't know what to do with all of your free time. Hey, Christy. Yes, it is you. Um, Amanda writes in, let's see here. Yeah, I think that's a great way to think about it, Amanda. I mean, I think libraries have recognized that it's challenging to get teens into the public library, right? So I think teen spaces is, is one way where some user-centered design has ha been happening for a while in libraries because folks have recognized, hey, we can't force these people to come in. We need to create spaces that are going to at least try to be appealing to them. Um, I think sometimes in libraries that is a little bit, uh, the um, result is like a little bit shallow sometimes. It's like, okay, let's put up a neon sign that says teen zone and we'll put a, a spinning rack of comic books, right? Um, that's like the common approach. Um, so I think it can go a little bit deeper. Um, but I think, uh, I think, yes, and that's a great point, Christy, that teens are the future users. So um, not only do we owe it to teens to provide great spaces for them, but we owe it to ourselves as well to turn them into lifelong library users, for sure. And, you know, if we can turn a teen into a library user, like a public library user, um, then they will use the library in higher education, and then hopefully they will use the library on the job as well. So um, let's do it. So any other questions or comments, um, you can uh, talk, you can chat, however you want to do it. Hi, this is Basha. First of all, apologies, because um, I actually got kicked out of the session for a moment there, so I had to re-sign in. I could hear it oddly enough, but everything was frozen. So, for example, I heard Erin asking me to do something, but I couldn't do anything. But now I'm back, and I would like to encourage everybody to uh, please, please feel free to speak. Just raise your hand so we don't all speak over each other, but um, I think um, please use that use your mic. And from my personal perspective as Aaron's former student, I wanted to let you know that um, we have completely redesigned a number of services um, at the library after I took this class. And um, right now we have a brand new um, website which is not perfect still, but so much better. Erin, you would be so happy to see that we don't have any of that crazy lesson navigation 
<laughs> we just completely did away with uh, that part, which was our home organization, which is a health system. Um, and they had about 20 different things you could select from on the top, on the side. That's all gone, and now it's all the library. And I redesigned every single sign in the library, and everybody's loving it. So thank you. Those, um, the class wow. actually had so a, great. Tamia. You know, a real effect on um, the experience of our users anyway. Well, that's good. You know, um, I think that's I think that's great. Um, please send me a screenshot. I don't think you did, and send me send me some pictures of your redesigned signs too um, in action. That would be uh, that would be great. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, you know I um, I love libraries. I want libraries to to be the best they can be. Um, so that's one reason why I'm I'm really enthusiastic about um, teaching this class is because um, I think it's great to sort of try to help uh, uh, turn turn future librarians and current librarians onto this stuff um, to spread it throughout the library world. So that's fantastic um, to hear. Um, okay, so Amanda, interesting question, asks about social media and libraries. I think it's fine. Um, I think it's fine for libraries to do this stuff. I don't think, um, I don't think it is the deepest form of innovation that goes on, uh, that could go on in libraries. So um, op I think for the past 10 years or past 15 years in librarianship, um, what passes for innovation has been a little bit shallow and it basically has gone like this. Hey, this cool new thing's happening on the web. Let's see how we can um, integrate it into our services. And that's a great thing to do. And I think we should be doing that. But to me, that's just using a tool, using what's available. And I don't think it's really a deep innovation at all. It's not looking at the needs of our users and our communities and really trying to figure things out and coming up with new things in that way. It's just using, using a tool. Um, so I think it's totally fine if libraries are going to experiment with social media and see if they can make connections with their communities. And if they can, great. I think it, uh, it's important to sort of get some metrics around all this as well and measure the success. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that freeform experimentation is not valuable. I'm not a total stickler for that. I think librarians should be free to experiment and play around. But in terms of like when it finally gets time to implement something, it's often a good idea to measure this so we know what the impact is and we know if we know it's, uh, if it's worthwhile or not. Um, and social media, you know, it's fine. Um, I think uh, sometimes it's not quite as effective as we hope it would be. Um, um, yeah, so that's my take on that. I've seen, I've seen social media stuff used really well in some libraries. I've also seen it, see, have seen it used poorly in many libraries. So like many things, um, it's a tool that can be used for good or bad. Okay, I'm just trying to catch up on the chat here. Amanda, does that, and let me just follow up, does that answer your question, or is that kind of what you were hoping I would talk about? Um, thank you, yes. Um, I was just wondering if, if, you know, a large part of what you do has been to, you know, really um, advise libraries, well, if you only have, I don't know what a reasonable amount is, like if you only have $1,000, your best bet would be to spend it on X. Hey, that's a cool way to conceive about, conceive um, of this. It's like an, it's an interesting challenge. Well, you know what? Um, I think what's more important than $1,000 is uh, devoting staff time and having some organizational change perhaps and getting a change in attitude of what's going on. So like there are a lot of really low hanging fruit that can be taken care of um, with just a um, change in attitude, a small course on graphic design, rewriting your website. I mean, there's so many low tech um, things to, to do um, that can really have a huge impact. You know, I wish there was a $1,000 widget of some sort, um, some kind of gadget, whatever, that I could um, sell to libraries or encourage them to buy and that would solve all the all their UX problems. But, um, you know, changing UX sometimes amounts to creating organizational change and having an attitude, a, 
expressing a new attitude, I guess. Um, so, um, quick and easy UX fixes. Um, there are there are plenty of them, sort of, if um, the stack time can get freed up. So, um, I think actually um, more important than um, thousand dollars is staff time, if that makes sense. Thank you. And for an example, um, check check out um, my latest column in Library Journal. It uh, talks about this project I'm doing right now in Florida with uh, six different libraries. They're all part of the library cooperative. And I'm taking folks through six different user experience improvement projects, one, one at each library. And they are all low to zero dollar projects. Um, so there is a decluttering project, there is a journey mapping project, there is a service desk prototype redesign project, um, there's a signage project, there are various things going on and they all um, just uh, don't cost anything. Isn't that neat? Oh, Dr. D, you're in Florida? That's great. I'm working with uh, Seth Lynn. Uh, this is the second time we have um, done this project. It's uh, pretty great. So I've been to... Uh, uh, the Boca Raton area and visited a bunch of different libraries I'm getting from Myra. Where are you? Look, where, where in uh, Florida are you, Dr. D? I'm in Lakeland between Orlando and Tampa. Oh, okay, great. I'm glad you're working with Shefflin. Yeah, they're great folks. Um, uh, Jeanette there is fantastic and, um, yeah. Also, it's quite, uh, quite possible to be doing something similar with Nestling coming up. And I've also done some work recently with, um, Plan the Panhandle Library area. Now. Really? Yeah, wow. So Florida, That's impressive. <laughs> Florida actually, Florida actually has some great library user uh, experience things going on right now. Excellent. I'd love to know more about them. So this is actually kind of a um, a bit of a philosophical question. Um, you mentioned, and that actually was also a takeaway from your class, talking about um, making the branding part of the experience, um, which I definitely think makes things look more professional. And um, but also, um, I found it to be a great um, um, marketing tool for libraries. So. You know, a big question is how to incorporate it into everything that we do. We sort of touched upon talking, getting stuff done, or, or re-envisioning the library from a position of strength rather than um, sort of grasping at, at straws. And then Christy, I think, mentioned, or Kristen maybe, um, mentioned um, including certain things such as reference and whatever in our brand so it's not just about books or um, not just about document delivery as it may be in, in the case of some special libraries or other things like that. How do we combine all of that to assert ourselves and create a great user experience at the same time? Is it, it may be too rambling of a question, but um, knowing you, you'll be able to synthesize it into something smart. So <laughs> if you've got the answer, let me know. <laughs> yeah, so I guess um, let me, uh, let's distinguish between the library's brand and the library's visual identity. So um, just want to make that clear. Um, you know, we think a lot about brands and we think about a logo, right? And logos are um, fun and great and interesting, and libraries um, should spend some time thinking about their logo. Uh, and the logo could could be uh, sort of one physical manifestation of the library's brand. But this whole concept of branding is sort of like um, the relationship between an institution and its users or its people. Um, so um, it, I think we need to be careful sort of putting the cart before the horse um, with developing brands in our libraries and in our institutions. Um, actually, one of the libraries uh, in Florida that I'm working with is, is um, we're working on some branding stuff, and the first thing that we have done is looked at the library's organizational values, and they are going through and talking with all their staff through a big survey and some conversations, and figuring out what it is that the library uh, thinks is most important. And then um, they'll do the same thing with um, library users as well. 
and trying to try to figure out um, what the strengths of the library are, what the library is doing well, what the public is currently thinking about the library. And he used that information to help develop um, the library's goals and what the library currently does into some sort of cohesive um, idea that should be expressed um, in like everything that they do, including their signage and including their logo, et cetera. So um, I think branding is important. Uh, I think there needs to be some meat and some substance uh, and some reality behind that because you can brand something in, in whatever way you want to, but if it's not living up to sort of the, I guess the term is, the brand promise, right, then there's going to be a disconnect there and the value will not be expressed and then that whole thing is going to fail. So I think uh, taking a hard look inwards first um, and uh, figuring out where the library is and what it's good at and what it wants to do is a, is a sort of a good way forward. So I hope that rambling answer was a, a decent response to your rambling question. <laughs> it was perfect and it gave me um, food for thought, especially the, um, you know, the idea of the services or things living up to the brand. I'll have to, that's, that's an that excellent point. Thank you. Yeah, great. Does anybody else have any more questions? Um, we're past the 7 o'clock, so I want you to be aware of that, but I don't want to rush anybody. Yeah, I can. I have time for one more question if, uh, if anything is here. And um, also, let me just put my um, email address on the screen if it's still being shared. Um, feel free to get in touch. You can send me an email at librarian at gmail.com. Um, and let me know about any cool UX stuff that you're, you've got going on or any other questions. Um, okay, Kristen H. comes in with a question at the last minute. Um, oh, so users versus non-users. I think this is a great question. This often comes up as well when doing persona development. So personas, if you're not familiar with them, are sort of um, fictional archetypal library users, and you can use them as a collection of your user research. They're like little repositories where everything you know about the people that it is you're trying to serve. And so there, there is a question like, should these be the people we're try, trying to currently serve or also people in the community that we're not serving? Um, so I think, there, I think there's, no, there's no wrong answer, basically. You should try to learn about everybody. And I think um, I think you can focus on different ways, uh, on different different aspects of this. So um, one project could, for instance, really focus on the readers in your community. How are you supporting people that are into reading? Um, for a kind of really straightforward, easy example, right? Um, also, you could then expand that out and um, say, okay, how is the library um, dealing with um, job seekers in the community? Are we doing a good job with those people. Um, should we get, or, I mean, are there any job seekers in the library or are those people mainly non-users and how can we better support their needs? So um, I like thinking about this stuff in terms of roles of uh, community members and whether these people are what current library users or not isn't, I guess, the important question uh, when gathering information, but when it comes time to create these programs and let people know about them, then it's, I guess, sort of important to get this stuff out in front of people if they're not currently users. So um, I think it can go both ways. I think libraries can think deeply about people that they currently are, um, have already captured the attention of and otherwise. Okay, thank you, Erin, very much for the great talk. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And please make sure to be in touch um, with any ideas or questions. And Erin's information is on the board. And you can always reach us through the SLA website. All right, thank you, and good night.
Good night, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming and taking the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks uh, to Basha and Grace for hosting. Take it Thank easy, you, everybody. Hope to see you in Florida sometime. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming, Doctor. Bye.